Hello and welcome back. Are you putting off your dream adventure until your travel bucket is full? Would you love to visit family but just don't have the cash for a cross-country ticket? Well, you're in luck because this week's Wealthy Wealthy podcast guests will share some amazing money-saving travel hacks to help you fulfill your travel dreams. Eli Facinda, otherwise known as Eli the Travel Guy, joins me to share some cost-saving travel hacks that will get you where you want to go by only using your credit card points. Eli founded Freedom Travel Systems to help people just like you quench their thirst for adventure. I can't even believe how much I learned from interviewing Eli. This episode is money. You'll learn how to spend on the right cards, upgrade travel through status and benefits, and maximize credit card points at 5 to 10x the value, and a lot more. So grab your suitcase and some sunblock, maybe your skis and goggles, and get ready to travel to the four corners of the globe by listening to this episode. Please enjoy my conversation with Eli, the travel guy. Eli, the travel guy, my friend, how are you? I am doing phenomenal, and I'm really excited to be here with you, Christina. Well, I'm so excited to be here with you, too, for a number of reasons. We were introduced through our mutual friend, Charles Bird. Is that correct? Is that who introduced us? Yeah, it was Charles, yeah. And then we had a mutual connection, Peter Sage. And so anyway, we have some history without really even knowing it, and it's great to to reconnect here. And Charles always puts me in touch with like the, I don't know if he does the same for you, but just the perfect matches. It's like, it's his genius. It's his magic. I'm like, Charles, how do you do that? But anyway, he said, Christina, you know, you're the whole money thing. And Eli, he's got a different spin on money and it's through travel and points. And I'm like, oh my God, I need an introduction because that points thing is something I've never figured out. And I know there's some hacks to it, but yes, please put me in touch. And here we are. So today we're going to talk about travel hacking and points hacking. But before we do that, tell us some story, even some stuff I don't know, a little bit about the Eli story, where you grew up, what inspired you, and really what brought us today where you're an expert in this specific category of what I call money. Totally. Yeah. And uh, and Charles is like magical when it comes to making crazy connections. So, so grateful that he did. Because um, knowing you has been also just a a really amazing way for me to level up in my life in other areas of finance that I haven't mastered, which there's plenty. Um, and so when it does come to the, the the credit card piece, you know, I was not ever really fascinated with credit cards. I was really fascinated with travel. And that started when I was actually about 17 years old. I grew up outside of the, uh, the DC area in Northern Virginia. And I was actually invited to go play on an international baseball trip where we were going down to the Dominican Republic. And, um, you know, we were representing the USA and I was going to go compete and play against kids from the DR. And I remember being on this trip, and it was a family vacation, meets kind of baseball tournament type thing. And I remember being uh, out in left field. And I'm 17 years old. I hadn't really traveled at all yet. I mean, maybe, you know, some domestic trips here and there. But I remember looking across the field while we're in the middle of this game. And I'm looking at these kids in the other dugout. And they had like, in terms of possessions, you know, wealth, uh, you know, the kind of typical things that we pursue here in the US, they had like nothing. Like they literally, a lot of them were using each other's cleats when they would come in and off the field because they, they didn't have their own, right? They had like one bat the whole team. Yet I looked into their dugout, they're laughing, they're smiling, they're having so much fun, they're playing with passion, the fans are dancing, there's like naked kids running around the dugout. And it's like, and I looked in our dugout and here we were with like our $500 baseball bat, fancy gloves, all this stuff. And I was like, wait, they're having way more fun than us, yet they don't really have anything in terms of like monetary wealth or possessions. Like in my brain that at 17, that didn't really make sense. Like the whole idea that, you know, uh, possessions and, and, and money doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a great, happy life was mind blowing to me. And so the whole point of that is I got hooked by just like, wow, if that's what's going on here, like what else is going on in the world? So I got obsessed with travel, ended up going to study abroad and that kind of unfolded into this addiction for travel. And when I graduated from school, I got kind of into the entrepreneurial path and I didn't have a lot of money. And one of the the quotes I'd heard was from our mutual friend and, and a mentor of mine at the time, Peter Sage, who said, you don't need money, you need a better strategy. And I was like, ah, I had heard about credit card points. This is it. So I went down the rabbit hole, figured out some cool things, started traveling, and then I just got obsessed. And so eight years later, here we are. And uh, what started as a passion and curiosity for the world turned into an obsession with travel, turned into a hobby with credit card points, turned into a business. And now we're here helping other entrepreneurs and individuals get the travel of their dreams. 
I love that. Thank you for sharing that story. And before we get into the specifics of travel hacking and points hacking, tell a couple stories, like really through traveling, like how has it advanced your perspective? Like how do you see or maybe think about the world differently through that lens? And and maybe tell us an experience because of learning how to do this and being able to travel to some epic places because you figured out this strategy. Yeah, tell some story. Oh man, there's so many. There's so many. This is gonna be this is podcast is gonna go three hours now. Um, no, so when it comes to a couple different things, how travels really shaped and shifted my life. Um, well, first of all, I just think for so many of us especially here in the US and especially business owners, we our focus as life goes on just gets smaller and smaller and smaller, right? We become very insular and then we worry about our business and then we're all tight here. And what happens is we get so locked in on our perspective that we forget to like zoom out and look at the broader picture. And travel tends to be one of the best tools to do that. You get out of your environment where you're so used to all the people and the, you know, the, the places for work and just like your normal day to day. And when you do that, you automatically just open your perspective. And that's where to me, the best new ideas come, the best new perspectives, the best innovation for your company. So I think it's actually really important for everyone to take that step away. And I've, I've felt that numerous times. And a couple of things I'll, I'll even uh, point to were, uh, you know, I was actually going over to one of Peter's conferences in London. And this is the first time I'd ever gotten an international uh, business class seat. Right? I remember I was like 23 years old. I'm probably making like $30,000 a year at the time. And the retail cost of the ticket that I was flying on was about six or $7,000. And I remember walking onto the plane and for the first time I handed the flight attendant my ticket and she was like, okay, sir, you can go, you know, to my left, her right, pointing to the business and first class section instead of back to economy. And I was like, oh my God, I remember walking down the aisle being like, I'm out of place. I don't know even how to act here. Like, what do I do? And I looked around, I was like, here's all these wealthy people who paid for this. And here's my like, kind of not that successful yet, you know guy just like getting on this plane for six dollars and sitting next to everybody and i was like this is amazing i just like hacked life and that opened up this whole idea of like wow if i could kind of be more strategic about this and find my way into this environment where else can i do that in my life and so that was one experience that just made me want to like think more strategically and and just kind of the whole work smart not work hard mentality and i thought about applying that in other areas um, another story i'll share just uh one more before we get into to everything else was actually last summer so uh, last summer, I met uh, my now girlfriend, and we were moving in in about a month, and we really hit it off. Like, I'm the best, you know, connection I'd ever had in my life in terms of like relationship and intimacy and all this stuff. And it was like we were on fire. And like a week into us connecting, I was going to Europe for a month. I had a uh, a trip with my other company, and I was like, "Well, shit, this is a damper." Like, you know, nothing worse than having a relationship building and just being gone for a month. And so, a week into the trip, I was like. Hmm. I was like, what are the odds that you could meet me in Italy next week? And she was like, uh, yeah, sure. And I was like, cool. So I had all the points, arranged it all, flew her out. We went to Sardinia, which is this amazing, beautiful Italian island. We spent a couple of days in Rome. Um, and we had this awesome getaway and it was like our second date, but it turned into like the foundation of just a beautiful relationship. And now we're getting to, yeah, take the next step together. And, um, and for me, just like, you know, us getting to go to a new country having that travel experience, it was such a unique way to, to kick things off. And so there's a gazillion more that I could share, but those were two that were really fun and specifically ways that I used points to create experiences in my life that I otherwise would have never had. Awesome. All right. That, thank you. And let's, that's a good segue. So let's talk about this thing called credit cards. And as you know, I teach and coach money and wealth creation. And Credit cards really get a bad rap because we associate credit cards with debt and usually consumer debt. And many times we're using credit cards to buy a lifestyle we can't afford. And so they get vilified. But, and so it's kind of, you throw the baby out with the bathwater and just get rid of the credit cards. Well, or we could, like you said, about money or a better strategy, a better strategy can be to use, if we're not looking at credit card as debt, but credit cards as purchasing power in a way, then we think about using credit cards to our advantage as, a, as opposed to our detriment. So I'm very, I mean, I really, you know, I've stacked all my American Expresses and have employees on American Expresses. And my intention, I'm going to pay for everything the same anyway. So 
strategically, I'm going to put as much as I can on my credit card. And I always ask if I can put it on my Amex where it's not even a normal place to put something on an Amex. For that reason, to accumulate those points. And now I think of those points as additional money. I just don't know how to use them very well. So anyway, I'm just sharing that is, the, is to think when we think differently about certain tools, credit cards can be u- used as tools, especially in what you're going to talk about. So let's talk about really just the mindset of using credit cards as a tool, different than debt and the other stuff. But what is your coaching to think about credit cards differently as a tool and resource to be able to use them to your advantage? Yeah, so there's definitely a mindset piece to it for sure. And we work with a whole range of folks. So there's some that are kind of like early into entrepreneurship, some that aren't even necessarily entrepreneurs, but they just maybe they're you know, freelancers or something like that. And we have people that are running multiple eight figure businesses that the mindset stuff is usually pretty, pretty locked in there. So overall, like you said, I mean, you can really treat a credit card like a debit card. And that's what we suggest. So things like paying your statement balance in full, setting up auto pay, even if someone's like, really wants to feel more control and comfort with that paying it like every week or daily, these are all options you have with a credit card. It's just to me, I'm like, well, if I'm already spending the money, and there's an opportunity to get an outsized return from the money that I'm spending, it would just make sense to take the biggest opportunity if I can minimize the downside. The downside is that you overspend, you don't pay attention. And so then you end up with either a late payment on your credit report, which is easily avoidable, or you start carrying balances and you, and you pay interest, right? So, so with the right kind of simple systems and tweaks, you don't even have to think about that. And that's kind of why I always point people to the system. It's like, you really should want, you should eliminate as much of the thinking around this as possible. It should be very systemized. So for us, we always recommend people change all your payment due dates to the same date across all your banks, set up the auto pay for a minimum payment. And so that way, once a month, you have a system where you go in, you pay your statement balance, and there's like, you know, it's a pretty uh, foolproof system if you do it like that. Um, so obviously, people have different relationships to what spending power is. And I think that's kind of something that someone has to be, just be honest with themselves around of like, are they spending beyond their means because they can, or are they actually treating it like a debit card? That's something that I guess that the person and the individual has to really have that honesty with themselves around. Uh, but for most people, that system is is simple enough and it allows them to use the credit card, get the maximum returns from them, just like you would, uh, and, and use it like just like you would a debit card, but again, not have the downside risk of of running into high interest. And there's even ways to leverage, you know, 0% uh, opportunities if you kind of get stuck in a weird situation. But that's a kind of a conversation for another time. But uh, that's generally kind of how we recommend it. And, and that sets people up for success. Awesome. And with what, what I think I've noticed, tell me if this is true or not, for someone who's traveled a decent amount for business and pleasure throughout my career, when I'm looking at, let's say, flights to somewhere else in the world, and I'm looking at a business class ticket, it seems like they are three times as expensive as they used to be, I don't know, maybe half a dozen years ago or something. And I'm just shocked. You're like, oh my God, like it's $10,000 for a business class ticket to London or something close to that. So my question number one, have business class, first class tickets, have they it really increased in price over the last several years? So not having like specifically studied that myself and having like, data to go off of. I can't really speak 100% on, on like factual trends in the industry. But what I can say is, is seemingly certain routes particularly have skyrocketed a lot. And and that that's the interesting thing is because like I live in Austin, right? And a common route to go to Europe, there's only three major airports you can fly into directly into Europe from Austin. London is one of them. Oftentimes, the route between Austin to London, you might see tickets at like 8 to 10K. But you could probably hop to Dallas or Houston and fly into call it Amsterdam, Paris, something like that for maybe like three to four K. So certain routes and particularly during certain times of the year will definitely have higher, uh, higher costs. But that is where being strategic with how you search for things will, will ship. But overall, I mean, the, the price has definitely uh, increased pretty significantly. And, uh, and the, the airline industry is just also one where, you know, it's so big and, and so established, it's hard to kind of have new innovation come in and shake things up. Like to launch a new airline is not the easiest thing to kind of, uh, you know, move the industry back to in terms of price. Um, I actually do have a buddy who is launching an airline right now, which is a wild thing. He's a British guy. It's almost like a Richard Branson type thing. So we'll see what he does. But other than that, I think that plays a factor too. And then, you know, I'm definitely not an economist, but the whole, you know, 
prices of oil and all that kind of stuff too. But it does seem like prices have gone up. Uh, but that is one of the beauties of, beauties of the points game is if you do it the right way, what's really cool is a lot of airlines have what we call a fixed award chart. So it doesn't matter if the price doubles or not because they have a certain number of miles that they will charge you to fly from region A to region B. So East Coast to Europe is always either like 70,000 miles or 60,000 miles or whatever it may be for that airline. So the price may go up double, but the number of points required doesn't change. And that's actually how we get this whole kind of points arbitrage opportunity. Awesome. All right. The reason why I started off with that question is because we're at one point I just might have been okay paying cash. It's like, I'm, that's not an option anymore. So anyway, now another thing is that, you know, when we accumulate points, let's say like myself, having accumulated a good amount of points because I just haven't traveled over the last several years. When I look at, hey, if I have a million points and it's a $10,000 flight, I've just used all my points based on what the 1% rule or whatever the airlines charge or Amex charge. So I look at that, I'm like, wait, one business class ticket? And that's, you know, uses like my whole million dollars worth of points, which means I spent a million dollars, <laughs> you know, it gets a $10,000 flight. So then it's really discouraging. I mean, I think that's part of why I've just let them accumulate because I don't want to spend them because it seems like it's almost a waste. And I'm trying to figure out how to spend them better, which is the unique timing of bumping into you through Charles was, oh, there's another way to do this. So talk to us about what do most of us don't know about points and how to like how we can use them. There's just the dono dono where we're using maybe a million points for one business class ticket. Totally. Uh, it's great. It's a great question because there's a lot of that in this space where there's a lot of things people don't know they don't know. And so there's kind of a couple of main things. We'll go high level here to start. First off, you need to earn the right types of points because there's all sorts of different types of points currencies and they can all do different things. Now, once you kind of realize that, you'll you'll see that there's a certain type of points what we call which we call transferable points. And these are points that you can convert from bank programs into airline and hotel loyalty programs. And this is like the holy grail. This is the sweet spot. This is where all the money's made with points. And again, the reason being is because to your point, pun intended, if you're going to Amex travel, they give you a fixed value on your points of one cent per point. So you have a million points, it's worth 10 grand. But if you have the ability to transfer them to airlines and hotels that have a whole other way of pricing, you can get double, triple, quadruple, 5x. Sometimes we've literally had times where we've gotten like 10, 15, even 20x value, which is crazy. So instead of a million points you know, being worth 10,000, now it's worth 20, 30, 50, sometimes 150, even in that case, it would have been worth $200,000 off of the same points. And so uh, that's kind of what a lot of people don't realize is that there is this opportunity to take the points they have and stretch them way further. And this is why a lot of people look at like my Instagram or what I'm doing or my business partner, Tommy, are doing. And they're like, I don't understand. Do you guys spend like a million dollars a month or are you like a trust fund baby and you're lying or like, what's going on? It's because we're able to take the same points that other people may have, but just get five or 10 times the amount of travel out of it. And so that's that's the big kind of main message here is if you can do that well, it'll unlock amazing experiences and a lot more of them. All right. So I'm hearing two things there just to take this step by step. The first thing that we didn't quite say, but it's like to be strategic about your accumulation of points. So we're assuming that you know we're treating it like a debit card. And if we can run all of our business expenses, and sometimes with Amex, Facebook ads, I can get 3x points for the ad spend. And, you know, there's even ways to, to amp up the points if you follow this. But so for step one is to think about how you can accumulate points, but just not any point, like you said, it's going to be transferable points. So that's step one. So are there certain credit cards? Like I use American Express Platinum, and then I have several cards underneath that that all funnel up to one point system. Is Amex a good one? Is it the best one? Are there others? Yeah. So the, the four main ones we like to start with are Amex, Chase, City, and Capital One. Well, those are really your four options to start with. And now Amex has Amex cards that earn Amex points, and they also have Amex cards that earn Delta points or Hilton points or Marriott points or you know other different programs. So we're talking about Amex cards that earn Amex points, or like if we're saying Chase points, a Chase card that earns Chase points, not a Chase card that earns, you know, Marriott points or United points, because they have other what we call co-branded cards. So 
Uh, I love Amex and, and Chase is the first two to start with because of the relationships that they have and just the ease of use. And they're very common cards, a lot of good ones. And, and you, you're, you're exactly on point. You want to find cards that are going to maximize your everyday spending category. So if you spend a lot on ads, the Amex Business Gold will earn, will earn four points per dollar on ad spend. If you spend a lot on travel, the, the business platinum will earn you five points per dollar on airfare and hotel purchases through uh, Amex Travel, right? So there's different ways where if you match those up correctly, you're going to amplify the amount of points you earn and have a lot more to, to, to be able to do. So I tend to like Amex as a really good starting point, and then Chase would be another one. And, and honestly, the difference between the two just comes down to preference and potentially even like where you live based off of like what airlines are flying from that, that hub a lot. That's a very more kind of specific thing. But either one of those, you're going to be in great shape if you start with either of those two programs. Um, Capital One would be another another good one, slightly behind the first two. And then City would be the last of the four in my choice. But um, any of those will be good options to start with. Great. And so I know you work one-on-one with entrepreneurs. I'll, I'll be working with you one-on-one, for example, when I'm ready to start my trip planning. But and then you do some programs and things. We'll talk about that later. But if you're, what are some things you're coaching your one-on-one clients that that are doing some travel, have some big trips, and what are two or three tips or tactics that mm-hmm. you're sharing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's really three main things to focus on. There's get the right cards and the right purchases so you can maximize your points. There's then how do you just upgrade your everyday travel and the experience? So we're talking about lounge access, free baggage, uh, upgrades at the hotels, free breakfast, free Wi-Fi, free Uber credits. Like, How do you take these card benefits that are already on a lot of the cards you have or that you're going to get and make sure you're getting the most value out of them. And how do you kind of play the status game in a way so that you can unlock amazing upgrades? Like that uh, trip to Sardinia, Italy that I mentioned with my my girlfriend, uh, we booked into a standard room when I booked that and we got upgraded to a suite because I have status. And I got that status mostly from spending on the right cards, not from actually staying in the hotel. But that took us for a room that was like already pretty nice, but like 1200 bucks a night and got us into a room that was like 3000 a night. So in terms of the quality of experience, massive shift. And that was all from just having the right spend on the right card. So we help with that and then guide them through how do you want to maximize the, the value of the points and, and teaching some of those kind of fundamentals. But um, a couple of key things like off the bat is, you know, just to uh, easy wins for people that we always like immediately are like, you got to have this, you know, things like lounge access. So most of the premium cars, the MX Platinum, Chase Sapphire, the Capital Adventure X, a lot of these kind of higher end cards are going to come with priority pass, which is going to get you access to 1400 lounges worldwide. So it's this big hub of uh, of lounge networks. And so that's something that's like a really easy win. Getting status at a hotel so that when you do stay in hotels, you stay pretty consistent with, with one brand primarily. And then you'll get upgrades. You get free breakfast, free Wi-Fi. You just get a better experience. You get a faster check-in line. So those are kind of a couple of things that are like easy, low-hanging fruit that we like to help optimize. And then the rest is honestly pretty custom because so many people have different travel preferences and different ways they're going to be using points. Someone who lives in New York and is going to uh, London four times a year because of business is a very different situation than someone who lives in LA and is going to Hong Kong and Thailand twice a year for vacation. The ways that you would want to earn and use points, for that is going to be pretty specific to them. So, so that's kind of where we help custom guide them and really help them understand the thinking behind why we'd want to get the certain cards we have and then how we'd want to use them more strategically for, for like the type of travel that they're doing. Awesome. And I, I think... If I understand correctly, some of the coaching you've given me before is that if you think you're going to have, let's let's just say personal travel in this case, and maybe you write it off to the business, but, you know, nice vacation one way or another. And it, let's say it's on the other side of the world. Let's say it's Africa or Bali or something, which is a very long, could be expensive trip if you want to do it a certain class, for example. But if it's six months away, it's probably good to start that planning now, right? Where so, because it's like, oh, we can accumulate points. Maybe we open a new credit card where they bonus to 50,000 or 100,000 points that could cover. So some coaching there too. Like if you know a big trip or you know you want to take a big trip to start the planning, how far in advance and then maybe call you or at least start doing this type of research? A hundred percent. It's one of the biggest mistakes we see is people wait and they just don't know they don't realize that waiting is is crushing them, not just from a points earning opportunity, but also an availability on the flights. Because when you go to book a flight or even a hotel on points, you're not going to see the same inventory that you see for cash bookings. Obviously, these airlines and hotels, 
They want cash. They want to make money. And so if they're not going to sell in cash, there's a certain percentage of the plane that they call award availability. So let's say there's 300 seats on an aircraft, maybe 100 are bookable with points. And they will release these like 11 months out from that date. So, you know, it's basically, let's just say it was Christmas, right? And you want to book a Christmas trip for 2024, right? You'd be best off trying to find that like in like January or February even of, of 2024. And so the earlier you hop on that stuff, the better. Now, if you, if you didn't find it, it's not like it's gone forever and you can't find any other options, but you're going to see the most options with the least, uh, with the best pricing, the earlier. So really like you want to stack as many points as you can with these transferable programs so that when it is time to go book something, you have as much options and flexibility as you want. Otherwise you have to either start to, you know, make some decisions around like, okay, do we want to maybe go out of our way a little bit to get a better deal? Or do we want to pay a little more? Sometimes you can strike gold, but you're increasing your odds by doing it earlier. So waiting to do this is a big mistake. We hear a lot of people that we talk to like, oh, well, I'm not traveling the next two months. So I'll do this later. And it's like, wait, I mean, you could wait, but like, you're just hurting yourself here. So if you're already spending the money, which is the hardest part of this whole process, it's like, it makes sense to optimize it now because you're going to continue to spend over the next however many months before you actually get to the point of booking. Got it. Awesome. All right. So let's talk a little bit of the hacking. We've talked about step one, which is just to be strategic with your points and to start really thinking about how you spend on credit cards and which credit cards so that you can accumulate as many points as possible. And I know something you've mentioned before that there's an app to use where it's easier to keep track of this, which I think this is another, again, the dono dono, because I know I leave so much money on the table because of my credit cards that I have. I get, I know one airline I, or one credit card slash airline, I get $100 worth of something, something, another one pays for my clear and another one does this, but I can't remember. And then they, I end up paying for these things is what I'm mm -hmm. saying. I'm not taking advantage of these. So yeah. how do you keep track of all these different benefits? Yeah, there is a great app called card pointers, which will help organize, basically load your card in and it will just tell you all the benefits that come with that card. And then as you use them, you can just kind of like check them off or, you know, if it's like a $200 credit and use a hundred dollars of it, you can like, there's like a sliding toolbar that you can use to just track how much you've actually used because that is um, a part of this process where it kind of becomes a pain for a lot of people, specifically, you know, busy entrepreneurs, people that are like really high value on their time. They're like, I don't want to be tracking all this stuff. Like I need to grow my business or I need to, you know, build my real estate portfolio, whatever it is. But um, at the same time, it feels kind of silly leaving money on the table, right? I don't care who you are. So an app like that helps you stay really organized and see everything in, in one clear kind of snapshot on the card side. And then even on the point side, there's another app called Award Wallet which is a great one and one called TripIt Pro, where it, it will sink in all your points from all these different accounts into one spot too. So the more you can simplify things and use the technology that's out there, the easier all of this becomes. And then you can you can have this whole system down without having it kind of take as much time. But card pointers is the one definitely that you're talking about. And, uh, and one of the things we'll also uh, help clients kind of work through or figure out is like, okay, if you have three cards that have a $500 annual fee and all three of them come with priority pass, Maybe you want to downgrade one of those cards or two of those cards so that you're not paying $1,500 in credit card fees and you're paying just $500 and you're still getting the same benefits. So sometimes people have too many high-end cards or, or maybe not enough and they need to kind of balance it better so they get the right benefits for them, but they don't start getting all these overlapping things that they can't continue to use as well. Got it. All right. So strategic with points, how to keep track of these things. And now let's talk about some of the... I'm just lack of better words, the hacking. And I think the transferable. So we've said we want to make sure we have transferable cards. What do you mean by that? So what's an example of a card that you can transfer points and one like Amex where you can? Mm -hmm. And what do you mean then by transferring points to who, what, where, and why? Yeah, so, so think of them as currencies, not necessarily just cards. So with Amex, they have cards that earn the Amex currency or cards that earn like the Delta or Marriott currency. And so we're talking about earning that right currency. And when you have that pool of points with American Express, because of their relationships, they allow you to convert those points into the airline miles or hotel points. And so you'll go into Amex travel, there's gonna be a section that says transfer points to partners. And then you'll find that and you'll see the whole list of partners. And now basically to do that, you need to have just like a loyalty account set up with that airline or hotel, you punch the loyalty number in, say how many points you want to transfer over, you hit send. And then basically it's like transferring money between bank accounts. It's the same idea. 
you'll just go to your your new account or whatever the airline account is, and you'll see the points in there. And so what you want to make sure to do is uh, find the actual seat or or hotel room first before you transfer them over. Because once you transfer them to an airline or hotel, you can't transfer them back, mm-hmm. right? So that's that's important to know. Now, again, there's only four main points currencies with like the major banks that can have this, that do have this feature and can be transferred out. And that's Chase, City, Amex, and Capital One. So if you're earning any other points currency, like PNC, US Bank, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, any of those, you're not going to be able to do what I'm talking about. You can still redeem those for travel through what's called like their travel portal, but you're not getting good value on that. You're not going to have this opportunity to get double, triple, quadruple, or like five to 10x the value on it. You, you, you get that kind of fixed value of one cent for each point. Okay. So that's some of the differences there. Now, a lot of people have cards where they're earning like Southwest points on a Southwest card that might be issued by Chase. And that's not necessarily terrible, but the, the limitation there is if you want to go to London, Southwest doesn't fly to London and you can't transfer those points or book with partners or anything with Southwest. So you're kind of stuck, right? So that's why it's better to have the transferable points because Chase, for example, partners with Southwest. So if you had Chase points instead, when you want to fly Southwest, you could just convert them at a one to one ratio and have those points appear in Southwest. Or if you wanted to fly United to London, you could convert your Chase points into United and book that ticket. So it gives you a lot more flexibility and options, which is where uh, part of the value is created from. Got it. Awesome. And you say Southwest, and I know a lot of people, I mean, they just love Southwest Airlines and, and you know, they're not big international travels travelers. Maybe they go to Mexico, they like Cancun, Costa Rica, maybe Hawaii. So that would be their the their trips. So any tips on for those that are really diehard Southwest flyers? Totally. Yeah. And Southwest is probably the most polarizing airline. It's like people either will like they love it or they hate it. Right. And uh, like they don't have a business class. Right. They're, they're very efficient with like their gate time. They're actually just from a business standpoint, fascinating to study them as a business and how they operate the way they do. But uh, yeah, one of the best Southwest tips is to get the companion pass. And so there's a way to do this is a awesome gem and this is probably going to be for a certain few people but for those who it hits for it's going to be like a game changer so for this one um all you need to do is earn 125,000 southwest points in a single calendar year now you can't earn those through transfer and they have to be like properly earned through either credit card spend or travel and when you earn 125,000 points you can then get a companion pass which means you can add a person to fly with you for free for the remainder of that calendar year and the whole next year so one of the things I always kind of tell people is like, if you're in a Southwest hub and you like flying Southwest that, and you have a partner, this is like the hack to get one person flying free for four years. Cause you would get it maybe in January, you get the rest of that calendar year and the whole next year. And then at the end of that next year, you'd flip it and they would get the companion pass and then add you back for two years. So there's ways to use Southwest cards where if you just hit the bonuses in the right way, you're going to earn 125,000 points just from opening the cards where you don't even really have to spend much or, or travel a lot. Um, and that's the fastest way to get this. And then, you know, getting one person flying free for four years, they do have routes to Hawaii now, uh, all over the US, some of the Caribbean and Central America, you got a lot of decent options there. But particularly for domestic flyers, and particularly for people that are uh, near Southwest hubs, it's a, it's a total game changer. Awesome. All right. So let's go back to some international travel. When you say transfer point, and so I get it now, I mean, I understand that I can go for my Amex and I can transfer my points over to American Airlines, for example. But then, is it not still one to one there or like one cent that I'm just buying my Amex, my, you know, on American now? They're offering the same thing. And so it uses the same points if I just bought it directly through American Express. So, how, how does it work over there? <laughs> This is where most people get lost, right? And this is this is the com- the complexity of it. And this is honestly probably why we have a business because like this whole nuance is weird because like technically you actually can't convert American Express points to American Airlines because they don't have a partnership. But Am- Amex does partner with British Airways, which is also partners with American. So if I wanted to fly, it's actually a great strategy, but if I wanted to fly American Airlines flights using Amex points, I have two options. I can either go through Amex travel or I can convert my points to British Airways to, or mainly British Airways to book that. And that's how I would do it because I can't do that con- direct conversion. But um, what you're talking about is basically the difference in pricing and the way that the pricing works through, again, the travel portal through Amex's travel site versus the way the airlines do it or the hotels do it. So 
it's called basically an award chart or a, a, an award pricing chart. And what they do is they all the airlines have different ways of pricing things that are not directly correlated to the revenue of the ticket or the cash cost of the ticket. When you go to Amex Travel or Chase Travel, that is a one-to-one -one direct correlation to the price. Technically, these entities are what's called OTAs or online travel agencies. So when you redeem your points through Amex Travel, you're basically redeeming your points to American Express. American Express, as an online travel agency, is buying a ticket for you. So it's just a one-to-one -one redemption like that. Right? When you convert your, your points into miles with an airline, British Airways has like a what's called like a distance-based reward chart. So they'd say any flight that's between zero and you know a thousand miles costs this many points. That's it. And so the price may do, let's say it's really high demand for there's a you know it, the Super Bowl is going on right and like the, the 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 ticket price may double as long as there's still points availability and the ability to use points through like through the airline that price in points won't change right with the airline because it's it's based off of distance for them each airline has its own unique way of doing it but this is how i'll give an example i flew to dubai from new york in first class last year and uh it's amazing you have you know a bar on board you get a whole private suite down perion caviar you get a shower like it's a crazy experience it's fourteen thousand five hundred dollars one way so if i went to amex travel this would cost me 1.45 million points because they give you one one to one value on your cent per point but I was able to convert those points into the airlines. And when I did that, it only cost me 136,000 points because Emirates says, hey, from they've, they've changed a little bit, but they say basically from New York to Dubai, this is what it costs. If, it, if first class is available, this is what you can get it for. And then you pay the tax and the fees, which is like 500 bucks. So that's the difference, right? The discrepancy is Emirates isn't pricing things based off of the cash cost. They price it based off of East Coast to Dubai is this much. And that's, that's where the whole opportunity comes in. Got it. That totally makes sense. And so then are you doing research that going to Emirates Airlines and finding out what, how many points that would cost, for example, and then going back to Amex and transferring over to Emirates and then using your points? Yeah. To yeah. So exactly. So it's a bunch of comparisons. And that's like when you become an expert in this or like that's kind of what our team is really good. We just know this stuff now. Like we've memorized it all. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Obviously, if you're going to Dubai, like that's where we want to get you to this airport and fly out of here. And this is the right aircraft because that one's the old one. It doesn't have the shower. So there's all these kind of like weird nuances to it. But that's that's a part of the game is is knowing like, oh, this is how you score the best deal. Uh, like if you're going to Japan, you you just randomly know that, okay, Virgin Airlines round trip on ANA would be a great deal. And you could find some certain crazy deals out of Chicago. And like there's certain kind of nuances to that where based off of the, the destination you're going, there's like maybe like 10 or 15 kind of plays that you're going to go to and look for first. And be like, how do we find one of these options if it's available? And so that's kind of the game. But if you're kind of new to this and you're starting to research it, what you would do is you would say, you can literally just take a piece of paper and just be like, okay, option A, cash price, X. Option B, travel portal. Okay, X, Y. And then you go option C, if I can convert to an airline, what do I find there? What's the best deal I can find there? You compare the three and then you make your decision on, on which flight you want to take. But if you don't know which airlines to search and which kind of airports to use, that's where can, people can get kind of confused. Um, so that's why having some guidance on that is helpful, but that's that's really how it actually works. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. I think I've got a much clearer picture now, and it's just such a game changer. Like again, I mean, this could be worth two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars. It's no joke. So thank you. Now we're talking about maybe some big international dreams or flights or vacations. Are there any tips just for upgrades, like, you know, for business travel to upgrade to business class when you're going from Park City, Utah to New York? That's a really long flight. Yeah. So for, for domestic flights, if you have status and depending on the airline, like they all have different ways of doing this, you know, you might get bumped up to, to a first class seat and first versus business class. It's kind of like interchangeable for domestic travel. If you go on international planes, a lot of times there is a true economy, premium economy, business, and first. So, But for domestic flights, primarily you're going to see first and business are the same. So you you there's a chance that you could get bumped up from Salt Lake to New York if you have status. But honestly, one of the best ways to do it if you do want to fly first class and you want to make sure you have that, that seat is just to book right into first class using some of the strategies I'm talking about. Um, unless you have a top tier status with that airline, the odds of getting bumped up aren't always that high. And it really, it just depends so much on the routing and and all that stuff. But if you, you know, you live in Salt Lake, which, or that's your airport, which is a Delta hub, 
and you're flying to JFK, which is also a Delta hub, there's going to be a lot of people that are like, you know, million milers on that flight, and they're going to take all the first class seats. So you're never, you never gonna get bumped up unless you have like diamond status with Delta, which is kind of hard to get. So if you're like, hey, I want to I want to make sure I have a first class seat, the best way to do it is to do what I'm talking about, where you find a way to transfer points and just book into first class and not kind of rely on an upgrade. Um, the same kind of goes for international travel, honestly, like you're certain airlines have programs where you can use certain certificates to bump up into first class. But primarily, you're going to want to just book into the cabin that you want to get into. Uh, that's the best recommendation. It gets very nuanced with each system. But that's that's overall, I always advise people, unless you're getting to the top status with the airline, if you want consistent first class, you should probably just be looking to to book right in. Got it. That makes me think, is there anything, does it make any sense, especially if you're, again, if you're going to do international travel, is to buy an economy ticket and then just use points to upgrade? You can, you can do that. And that's a good play specifically for like people that maybe you're speaking at an event and they're like, Hey, we'll pay for, pay for a ticket, but we can't pay for first. Or, you know, it's a business event or you're a consultant or whatever it is where someone else is paying for your, your economy ticket. There can be some good options to take that ticket and then apply points for an upgrade or something of that nature. Sometimes there are credit, there's certain types of credits you can apply. Uh, so that can, that can work, but it's just, it's a little bit less reliable because someone like the first class cabin can just get booked by other people. And then you're not going to get upgraded, right? Because there's no inventory left. So that's why I always say, like, if you really want the seat, just go ahead and, and book it in. Um, otherwise, yeah, you can use economy tickets and, and then use points to upgrade. Um, if you're going overseas, you're really typically only going to be able to upgrade one one cabin, though. So like, if you book an economy ticket and you're going to London, you know, you're going to be able to upgrade the premium. Typically, you're not going to be able to jump all the way into like business or first class. Awesome. Well, thank you. Is there anything I've been asked that you think is important to share with everybody listening? I think we covered a lot of really good stuff. I think that piece on status is important for people because what I see a lot of that I would advise away from is, and this is, I mean, it's geniusly designed by the airline and hotel program. The whole status, like the the loyalty program is just an art form of of creating consumer loyalty and and really creating, yeah, lifelong loyalty with a lot of customers. Um, but a lot of people go for status when they probably shouldn't. And the reason for that is, in my opinion, you're specifically with airlines, you're really not going to, again, see a lot of the, the the worthwhile experiences and benefits until you start to get to some of the top tier statuses. And those are oftentimes really difficult to get to unless you travel a ton or you spend a ton. So a lot of people are going to be like, oh, I like Delta. So they always fly Delta when there was a cheaper and direct option on American. And so now they just took a longer flight and they paid more. And the payoff for that long term isn't even that much because they're not really going to get consistent upgrades and stuff from that. So I'm not a big fan of going for status with airlines, particularly unless you're going to get towards the top. There's certain qualifications on the hotel side. It's a little bit different because it's easier to get and and uh, you don't really have to do that much different to get it. So that's just one thing I always like to caution people on is like thinking about that uh, that piece of the game too. When we're talking about hotels, do you have a favorite hotel chain that is best for? points and upgrades and that you prefer to choose them if you have the opportunity? Totally. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's really three major brands here. There's Hilton, Hyatt and, and uh, Marriott. IHG also is like a decent points option, but really the main three are, are going to be those. And I'm a Hyatt. I love Hyatt. Um, I think that their experience at most of their hotels is amazing. Um, they have a really cool collection of unique hotels called the SLH small luxury hotel collection. So really cool boutique experiences, particularly in Europe. Um, but the main thing is their the value on their points is much higher. So like Hilton and Marriott have inflated their their system. So the value on the points is way less. So for example, you may see a room that costs five hundred dollars, right? With Hyatt points, it might cost you like twenty thousand points. With Marriott points, it might cost you like you know eighty thousand or something like that. And so if you're transferring Chase points at a one to one ratio, you only have to transfer twenty thousand points to Hyatt to get a five hundred dollar hotel. Whereas if you were going to go to Marriott, you might be transfer eighty thousand. So it's like the trade off is significant there. Um, so I love them for that. I think their their experience is awesome, and plus the way you can get status there is, is great too. So I'm a big Hyatt guy, but everyone has different reasons for liking different brands. Marriott has the biggest global footprint. So if you're like a frequent business traveler, that's like I just want to always know them and have a hotel in the best location. Marriott may be your move because there's some places where there's not a lot of Hyatt options. So you have different reasons for different hotels. Awesome. All right. Well, Eli, thank you so much. And like I said, I feel I feel richer just by having this conversation. That's the goal. That's the goal. Awesome. Awesome. 
All right. We're going to wrap up a few questions and then let everybody know how to find you. First question is, say, Christina, if you really, 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 really knew me, you would know that. What's something that most people know about you? Hmm. You'd probably know what my favorite quote is, because I say this probably an obnoxious amount to people that are around me. And it's, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive, because what the world needs is more people who have come alive. So that's been like a North Star for me. And that's also been, I think, a lot of why I got into travel, because, you know, I was running a tour company for a while, and just like seeing people go on these experiences and go overseas and seeing the world, it's like, you just see the light come on in their eyes. And it's, it's like, so awesome to be a part of that experience. And so that's probably one thing you would, uh, you would know about me. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, you just bring up such a good point there as well as, you know, again, just talking about it in points, that this opens up maybe an experience that might not otherwise have felt available. And so taking advantage of this might open up a new experience. So, and you oh, oh, yeah. Feel I mean, more alive. Totally. And that's a huge piece because it's funny, even when we work with like eight figure business owners, they have the money to do this a lot of times. But even for that, even if you're taking home multiple seven figures a year to spend $15,000 on a one-way ticket to Dubai, it just seems kind of ridiculous, right? You, do, you know, there's some people who don't care, but most people are like, oh, there still is like twinge. But it's like, hey, you can use points and then you can take your family to Dubai and have this crazy experience and go to the Maldives. And now you have an experience that you're never going to forget that's going to pay dividends in terms of your, your satisfaction, your fulfillment. I'm like, I'm all in on that. And so sometimes we're just using this as a way to justify doing the things that, that people already wanted to do, but they just couldn't find the reason to give themselves permission to do it. Yeah. And I'd put myself in that category. So thank you. <laughs> you totally. uh, let's talk about what I call a humble brag. What's something that you're personally proud of? You know, we all have our bios and our resumes and our accomplishments and, and all of that that's very public, but what's something you're personally proud of? So in nine years of, of being involved in running companies, I've only ever lost an employee like who left without me like letting them go one time. And uh, that's something I'm very, very proud of. I love having a good team and really supporting people in a way that, that there's like a lot of mutual respect and having team members that have your back is like, it's awesome. So um, that's something that, uh, yeah, I have seen about that recently. I was like, that's really cool. Having super low turnover in terms of employee. And uh, yeah, it's just, that's, that's one thing I'm definitely proud of. Yeah, well, that's a huge accomplishment. That says a lot about you because that's not easy. All right. So let's do the flip side of that. What's something like a failure, like a dark moment, a failure, something where you just thought, oh, my God, I totally effed this up. I don't know how I'm going to recover. Maybe I should just give up. You know, whatever that dark, low moment is. But ultimately, you're here and you're doing great and doing just fine. But tell us one of those, one of those tough moments. Yeah, I got quite a few to pick from. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of them would be, so we didn't talk much about this, but basically right out of school, I started helping to build this, this international tour company, got into the travel industry through that, uh, learned a lot of the credit card points, the stuff that I know through applying it in that, in that business. Now we had a, we had this awesome business and it was like doubling every year, 2019, we crushed it. We're, we're growing 2020 comes around COVID hits. I mean, you know, we went from like almost going to 4 million in revenue to 150,000 in a year. Like just completely, but here was the, here was the thing that we, we and I made the biggest mistake on is we kind of have these like self-affirming biases sometimes of what we want to happen versus what's actually happening. And it took us a long time to take a look in the mirror of like, oh, this might not go away for a while. This might be a long-term issue and we may have to like prepare for the storm kind of thing. And because we didn't want to look at that, we ended up kind of, you know, acting as if all the trips were going to go off and things were going to continue. And we didn't really prepare and, and build a little bit more, I guess it was a tough situation for anybody, but we, we could have acted sooner to, to put the business in a better position to protect the downside. And we didn't. And that hurt a lot. Like that bit us pretty bad in terms of just like costs and having to deal with certain types of refunds and a lot of things that make a business really tough. So that wasn't necessarily like a, a, a personal crisis, but it was more, more of a business lesson and kind of a life lesson where it was like, because we didn't want to look at this thing, we kind of avoided it. And then like, this was the downside of it. We learned a lot in the experience, but it was definitely a tough lesson. Yeah. Well, I think we're all guilty of that, of, of being too optimistic maybe. And <laughs> just, um, 
making decisions accordingly. So thanks for sharing that. Sure. All right. One, one final question to wrap us up is to bust a myth. And so what's something from your point of view, your experience, where you're just going to call it out? Mm. Well, I'm going to go on with specifically for like the credit card points and all that stuff. If you're using cashback cards, you got to get rid of them. If you travel at all, if you travel at all, you got to get rid of your cashback cards. And I'll throw in a bonus, even though you didn't ask. If you're using your points on Amazon, just stop doing that too. So those are the two things that I see a lot of people do. And they, they're like, oh, but it's like 3%. And, you know, and I get to buy my new vacuum. But it's like you're missing on way more upside and way better experiences if you use the points for travel more effectively. So uh, that's just like specifically to credit card points and, and miles and spending. Those two are definitely things you, you got to stop doing. All right, Eli, thank you so much. Again, you're just a total wealth of knowledge. And for any of us that accumulate some points and love to travel, you just made us a lot of money. So thank you. Very, very worthwhile hour of, of time. To uh, For everybody that's listening that may want to connect with you, I know there's a couple of ways to work with you and your team. So mm-hmm. share with that. And I know your Instagram, but let everybody know how to connect with you. Yeah, yeah. So one of the best ways would be Instagram. That's just going to be at Eli, E-L-I, travel guy. And you can even, if you want to, and you're interested in learning a little bit more about this stuff, you can shoot me a DM with the word mini. That's M-I-N-I. We have a mini course that's normally 50 bucks. Uh, We'll send it over to you for free. And so that'll be a great way to kind of dip your toes in the water, learning a little bit more of this, seeing some screen shares and like things that we're talking about here more in action. Um, So you can get access to that if you'd like or ask any questions there and and I'll get back to you on on Instagram. Um, The other way, if you're interested in talking about, hey, you guys have some services, like how do we learn more about that? You can set up a free consult on our website, just freedomtravelsystems.com. Um, really value adds. So we'll break down your numbers, show you where you're probably using the wrong cards in the wrong situations, leaving money on the table, stuff like that. Uh, so that'll be just at freedomtravelsystems.com. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys reach out or at least check out the Instagram and engage with some of the fun because it's pretty cool what you can do. And, and seeing the visuals on it ends up making it a lot more uh, exciting as well. Awesome. Eli, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and I love these conversations and just you, what I love what you're doing is you're just really sharing all this and making it available to everyone. So thank you. Absolutely. Of course, it was a blast and thanks for having me on, Christina. My pleasure. So that's it for this episode of the Wealthy Wealthy Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. But before you go, I want to offer you the opportunity to test your money IQ by taking my two-minute money quiz that tests your financial literacy. It's only 10 short questions, but I promise it will make you think. The average score is 33% out of 100. Do you think you can beat that average? But wait, there's more. Beyond just testing your financial IQ, you'll receive a free How Much Is Enough worksheet, which is a step-by-step guide to help you determine where you are on the financial freedom track. This is the exact work I do with my VIP clients. Take the quiz and let me know how you score. Just go to christina.com forward slash quiz. That's Christina with a K and two S's, like kiss. Again, that's Christina, K-R-I-S-S-T-I-N-A dot com forward slash quiz to test your money IQ.